divine deliverance to those who act in faith. Brother David. A loyal servant of Jehovah God named Mordecai stood in the middle of a great and the distressing news that he heard it that day caused him to rip his garments in half. He then dressed in sackcloth and he put ashes on the top of his head. Now had someone died? Had he been disgraced in some way? You see, tears started to fall from Mordecai's eyes and sadness and sorrow filled the entire city. You see, he wasn't alone in his mourning. Thousands of Jews were weeping, wailing, mourning, fasting in that great city. But, but why? You see, those Jews lived in the mighty Persian Empire. And the prime minister named Haman fooled the king, King Ohasuerus, into believing that the Jews were a threat to national security. Therefore, a decree went out that within one year, every single Jew in the Persian Empire would be executed. An act of genocide. Perhaps the only thing that would subside Mordecai's tears was the willingness of a young girl, a young orphan girl named Esther. He raised her as his little daughter. He was actually her older cousin. And see, by a series of events, Esther was now queen of the Persian Empire. And her husband, King Ohasuerus, had no idea of her true ethnicity. He did not know she was a Jew. But see, Mordecai thought that perhaps her influence on the king could subside the king's decree and she could stop the genocide of her people and save all of their lives. But see... Esther's willingness to approach the king, it can't be compared with when you sisters may approach your husband uh, for a brand new car that you know you can't afford or a brand new dress that you know you can't afford. You see, the most he can say is no. But see, this was different. In the Persian Empire, law states that anyone, anyone, including the queen, who approaches the king without being summoned, if he doesn't hold out his golden scepter to you, you will die. So Esther hasn't been approached by the king in over 30 days. If she walks in uninvited, he could take her life just like that. So for three days, she and the Jews are fasting and they're praying night and day, beseeching Jehovah God until she found out it was time. You see, have you ever been in a situation where you weren't sure if you were going to live or die? Perhaps you have. But in most cases, we're not presented with a choice to put ourselves in that position. You see, Esther had a choice. And her choice was motivated for her love for Jehovah, her love for her people, and this tremendous, unyielding faith. So without hesitation, that young girl got dressed and she got ready to approach the king. Would she live or would she die? We invite you to open your Bibles to the book of Esther, the fifth chapter. That's Esther chapter 5. And together we will read verse 1. Esther chapter 5 and verse 1 where it states, And it came about on the third day that Esther went dressing up royally, after which she took her stand in the inner courtyard of the king's house, opposite the king's house, while the king was sitting on his royal throne in the royal house, opposite the entrance of the house. So Esther's about to approach the king, and you can imagine her little hands are shaking, and her heart is pounding. You ever have your heart pound so hard you feel it in your throat? Yeah, you see, that's how Esther felt, because she wasn't sure what was going to happen. But then as she approached the king in verse 2, it says, It came about that as soon as the king saw Esther the queen standing in the courtyard, she gained favor in his eyes, so that the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. 
Esther now came near and touched the top of the scepter. Whew. What a sigh of relief. Divine deliverance from Jehovah had saved her life because she acted in faith. But did you notice interesting in verse 1, of chapter 5, it says that when she approached the king, she dressed up royally. You see that? Why? Because she was approaching the king in his royal throne, in his royal house. So that reminds us, friends, of what we spoke about this evening in our Bible study. Are we dressing appropriately, royally as it were, as we enter the royal house of Jehovah? Or we're serving in the outer courtyards of his royal temple as we go out door to door in the ministry. You see, some people feel that it's not a big deal how I dress. You don't judge a book by its cover. Well, especially in the ministry, it's been stated that people do form opinions based on what they see. You know, whether or not your book gets read has a lot to do with how inviting your cover is. And so our cover, if it's inviting in the ministry, that gives us a, a greater opportunity for people to be impressed by us and want to listen to us because we represent the royal house of God. You know, one researcher said what people see and not what they hear has a far greater impact, at least initially. And many of our sisters, they approach me and they, and they say, well, Brother David, my definition of modest is different from another sister's definition of modest. Well, it's true, a Bible principle it is. But if you would like some more details on highlighting that Bible principle, I'll give you a reference. The 84 Awake, November 22nd, page 23. 84 Awake, November 22nd, page 23. It's an article entitled, Fig Leaves, Fashions and Figures from a Woman's Wardrobe. Now, in this article, if you ever want to test if your style is modest or appropriate for a specific occasion, this article talks about it. If you ever want to determine the difference between having a fad and a style that's truly attractive on you, this article talks about it. If you ever want to determine if my clothing was too tight or clingy, this article talks about it. And that age-old question, what's the proper skirt length? This article discusses that too. So if you would like further di direction on that subject, you're more than welcome to look it up. But let's go back to the Bible. Let's look at verse 3 of chapter 5, and it says, Then the king said to her, What do you have, O Esther the queen? And what is your request? To the half of the kingship, let it even be given to you. Well, in turn, Esther said, If to the king it does seem good, let the king with Haman come today to the banquet that I have made for him. Accordingly, the king said, You men, have Haman act quickly on the word of Esther. Later, the king and Haman came to the banquet that Esther had made. Now, you may be wondering, why in the world would Esther invite Haman? I mean, Haman is the man who started that scheme of this genocide. Remember, Haman's desire to kill all the Jews originated with his hatred for her older cousin Mordecai. You see, Mordecai refused to bow down to Haman, the prime minister, as everyone else would. And so when Haman saw that, he says, I'm going to kill him. In fact, I'm not just going to kill him, I'm going to kill his whole family. And so there was the origination of the desire to execute every Jew in the Persian Empire. But, you know, Haman has no idea that Esther's a Jew. The king has no idea she's a Jew, and they have no idea, little do they know, that Mordecai is her older cousin. And so, while having the banquet for the king and Haman, the king asked Esther the same question he asked her before. If you look at verse 6, it says, In time the king said to Esther during the banquet of wine, What is your petition? Let it even be granted to you. And what is your request? To the half of the kingship, let it even be done. Now, instead of answering him, Esther says, that's a good question, but I'll answer that question tomorrow. I want you and Haman to come to another banquet tomorrow, and then I'll answer the question. Well, Haman loves that. 
He's thinking, he, he's smiling, his chest is puffed up. The queen invited me to a banquet today and she wants to, for me to come to another one tomorrow. With the royal family, I will dine. And so he's smiling going home and he's smiling until he sees something. Let's notice what he sees in verse 8 or verse 9. It says, consequently, Haman went out on that day joyful and merry of heart. But as soon as Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate and that he did not rise and did not quake on account of him, Haman was immediately filled with rage against Mordecai. You see, anyone else, if he saw Haman, would have got down and bowed down to him. But not Mordecai. Mordecai refused because he viewed it as an act of disloyalty to God. But did you notice Haman, how he couldn't be happy? And you know, he's smiling and jovial until he sees someone. Haman couldn't be happy because he was too busy resenting Mordecai. You know what that teaches us, friends? When you resent someone, you, in effect, become their slave. Have you ever looked at it that way? When you resent someone, you become their slave. Think about it. You're at home in your bed, and you're sleeping, and they're in your dreams. Right? I mean, they're affecting your digestion. They're robbing you of your peace of mind. In fact, you you're go to the kingdom hall, you're smiling, shaking hands, <laughs> Until you see that person ruin your whole meeting, didn't they? You're at work at your desk and you're thinking about that person. You're driving with your family on vacation and they're on your mind. It robs you. In Matthew 6, verse 15, it shows it can even nullify your prayers. In fact, cause some friends to start taking medication. You see, friends, when you resent someone, you become their slave. It's a Haman-like spirit that we as Christians don't want to adopt. In fact, look at verse 10 through 13. In verse 10, it says, however, Haman kept control of himself and he came into his house. Then he sent and had his friends and Zeresh's wife brought in. And Haman proceeded to declare to them the glory of his riches and the large number of his sons and everything with which the king had magnified him and how he exalted him over the princes and the servants of the king. And Haman went on to say, What is more, Esther the queen brought in with the king to the banquet that she had made no one but me. And tomorrow also I am invited to her with the king. But all of this, None of it suits me as long as I am seeing Mordecai the Jew sitting in the king's gate. Did you notice all his privileges? Did you notice all the things that he had, his, his, his money and his sons and, and the privilege of being with the king and the queen? But he's still unhappy. You see, he wasn't content with the privileges that he had because he was too busy focusing on others. You know, there was a ministerial servant named Michael in the Congregation of Jehovah's Witnesses, and he'd been reaching out to be an elder for years. And when his longing went unfulfilled for years, he got so bitter, he says, don't even, don't even consider me for that anymore. He got so bitter. In fact, he says, I just couldn't bear the pain of the disappointment again. You know, Michael obviously forgot two, two things. Two scriptures come to my mind when I think of Michael. 2 Corinthians 4, 7, which tells us that your ministry is like a treasure. And also the 84th Psalm, verse 10, where it says, A day in your courtyard, your courtyard is better than a thousand elsewhere. So to sit in the lobby of the kingdom hall is better than to be in Buckingham Palace or the White House. You see, that's what the psalmist was saying. The, your ministry is a privilege. It's a treasure. Being at the hall and participating is a privilege and a treasure. But see, perhaps he temporarily forgot those things. He valued those blessings highly and deeply before, but the disappointment of not receiving that appointment pushed those blessings to the side. And so as we may have to reexamine the way Jehovah's already blessing me, 
And we may have to ask Jehovah to open our eyes to the privileges that we're already receiving. We have to realize that some privileges require special qualifications. And we have to look inside ourselves and see, maybe I need improvement. You see, don't enviously assume that someone else got this privilege because of favoritism or, or a nepotism. It wasn't theocratic. You see, when we brood over those ideas, contention and jealousy and uh, strife and resentment cause us to say, I just give up altogether. And see, that's a Haman-like spirit. In fact, look how look at the, the, some more direction that his bad example gives us. If you look at verse 14, it says that that Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends said to him, let them make a stake 50 cubits high. Then in the morning, say to the king that they should hang Mordecai on it. Then go in with the king to the banquet joyful. So the thing seemed good before Haman, and he proceeded to have the stake made. Did you notice the danger of listening to counsel that's not objective? To counsel that's biased? Did you notice who Haman was talking to? His wife? His friends? This is good counsel for congregation elders. Because Haman told his family and his friends the affairs of the kingdom. How much should elders be careful not to tell their wives and their family the affairs of the theocratic kingdom? You see, because our wives aren't spiritually qualified to handle the information. You see, they're only concerned about your happiness. And when you think about it, notice how Haman's wife reacted. His family, they said, well, get up in the morning and hang Mordecai. Then you can go to the banquet joyful. Well, say, imagine you brothers come home from an elders meeting, right? And, and, and your wife see you're stressed out and angry. And they're saying, well, what, what happened? You spill everything. And she, he did what? You better hang him. And then go to the kingdom hall joyful. You see that same spirit. And so we have to realize that our family and friends are only concerned with our happiness. But the elders who are qualified to hear this information are concerned with the happiness of the congregation. And isn't that what Jehovah's concerned with? And so we, we really learn from the danger of doing this. And you see, Haman loved the idea. He loved the idea, so he spent the rest of that evening putting up a 50 cubit stake. You know, that's 73 feet high. And he couldn't wait to see Mordecai hang in the morning. And he just couldn't wait to tell the king. But you know something? Mordecai is grieving, crying, ripping his garments in the middle of the city, thinking he's going to die within a year. Little does he know, he may have less than 24 hours to live. At this point in this Bible drama, friends, we see a direct act of divine deliverance. You see, that night, for some reason, the king is tossing and turning in his bed. He can't sleep. You ever have a night like that? You're just tossing, flipping your pillow, and you just can't sleep. You just say, I'm going to just get up. Well, that's what happened to the king. If you look at chapter 6, starting at verse 1, it says, During that night, the king's sleep fled. Therefore, he said, to bring the book of the records of the affairs of the times. Thus there came to be a reading of them before the king. At length, there was found written what Mordecai had reported concerning Big Thana and Tiresh, two court officials of the king, doorkeepers who had sought to lay hand on King Ohasuerus. So the king can't sleep, right? So he says, you know what, just read to me the records of the kingdom. And so as they're reading it to him, he says, wait a minute, what, what did you just say? He realized that Mordecai stopped an assassination plot against him. Imagine if you stopped an assassination plot against the President of the United States. Well, he was the most powerful man in the world at this time, so it's the same thing. And then in verse 3, he says, well, what honor and great thing has been done to Mordecai for this? To this, the king's attendants, his minister said, well, nothing has been done with him. 
So the king realizes he owes his life to Mordecai. And nothing has been done to honor him for this. Here, friends, no doubt, Jehovah's hand is involved. I want you to think about this. Where was the king that night? He was at the banquet of wine. Now, in Esther chapter 1, it shows how the Persians loved to drink. The liquor flowed nonstop. They drank extremely heavy. So if a man is drinking all night long and he can't sleep, then you know it's an act of God. It's true. Jehovah can control any government or government official at his beck and call. In fact, the 21st proverb, verse 1, says a king's heart is as streams of water in the hand of Jehovah. Everywhere that he delights, he turns it. So he can do anything to any government official or king to, to reflect his purpose. So now it's early in the morning, and Haman's 73-foot stake is hanging high. And he can't wait to tell the king, let's hang Mordecai on this. Now, you know when you want to tell somebody something as soon as you see them? Your mouth is open, but they say something first. Well, that's the case here. Haman's mouth is wide open. If you look at verse 6, it says, and Haman came in. It says, when Haman came in, notice the king proceeded to say to him. So the king spoke first. He says, what is to be done to the man in whose honor the king himself has taken a delight? At this Haman said in his heart, to whom would the king take delight in rendering an honor more than me? Right? So he's saying this in his heart, and he's imagining, oh, I know he's talking about me. Oh, how would I like to be honored? And then it hits him, right? It hits him. In fact, if you look at verse 8, it says, he says, let them bring royal apparel with which the king does clothe himself, and a horse upon which the king does ride, and on the head of which the royal headdress has been put. You see how conceited he is? He says, dress me like a king, put the headdress on me like the king, and ride me like the king. You see, he wanted to be the king, didn't he? And see, he wasn't just comfortable or happy with dressing himself. He says, oh no, I want a noble prince, some noble prince in the empire, whoever he may be, I want him to dress me in front of everyone. I want him to put the royal headdress upon me in front of everyone. And then I want him to ride me through the courtyards of the city in front of everyone. And this noble prince, whoever he may be, should call out this way. This is how it is to be done to the man in whose honor the king himself has taken a delight. Right? You can see the trumpets blaring, right? And he's riding the horse and he's waving to the crowds. You see? And see, Haman can see all of this in his head, right? But see, now, it's interesting, you know, he can't wait for the king to tell him, you're the man to be honored. He knows it's him. And so the king, he loves the idea. In fact, look at verse 10. Look what the king says. It says, at once the king said to Haman, quickly, take the apparel and the horse, just as you have said, and do that way to Mordecai, the Jew who is sitting in the king's gate. Do not let anything go unfulfilled of all that you have spoken. How much money would you have paid <laughs> to see Mordecai's face? And let me think, let me, let me ask you, who do you think the noble prince was who would ride Mordecai through the city? It was Haman himself. Just like our young people say, Haman had to give Mordecai his props in front of everybody. When he really wanted to see him hang, right? And so, you know, it's not that he, you know, you can imagine how painful that must have made him feel. I want to see this man hang. My stake is waiting for him. And now I have to parade him through the city and call out in his honor. You know, could we fall into a similar situation? 
Is it painful for us to congratulate someone else who's received a privilege that we've sought for? Is it hard for us to rejoice in someone else's progress? And if that's true, what would that say about our heart condition? You see, when we think about privileges, friends, we don't want to view privileges as badges of merit, stripes like in the army, right? Like we've gone up some corporate ladder. Because Jesus said, whoever wants to be great among you must first be your minister, which means your servant. He says, whoever wants to be first among you must first be your slave. That's the Christ-like way of viewing privileges. And see, that's what we want to adopt as a congregation. But now what an act of deliverance. Jehovah God saved Mordecai. I mean, the man's act was totally unnoticed by the king all that time until he needed to be remembered the most. And that one moment saved his life because he would have hung the next morning. And when Haman, when you think about it, he paraded Mordecai through the city. He honored him. He called out to him. The trumpets blared. He rode him through the city. But when he got home, he put a cover over his head and he began crying like a baby, right to his wife and to his same friends. But now notice what they said to him. Look at their advice now. In verse 13, it says, And Haman went on to relate to Zeresh, his wife, and to all his friends, everything that had befallen him. At that, his wise men and Zeresh, his wife, said to him, If it is from the seed of the Jews that Mordecai is before whom you've started to fall, you will not prevail against him, but you will without fail fall before him. So his family and friends were basically looking at these turn of events. It's like an omen. It's like a sign that what is bad to come is going to happen. They gave him no support. They gave him no encouragement, even though the man's crying like a baby. You know, it makes us think about ourselves, does it not? Are we encouraging in the congregation? Are we supporting our brothers and sisters in the congregation? You know, when we come to the meetings, do we look, well, who's going to encourage me? Or do we look to encourage others? You know, the Greek word for encouragement literally means to call someone to your side. When a young child hears the thunder or lightning, what? They run to your side, don't they? They're afraid of the dark. What do they do? They run to your side. And so if you call your brother to your side and you walk side by side with him and he stumbles, he falls, you're there to catch him, aren't you? You're there to give him encouragement. Is that a part of your personality? Those who are appointed in the congregation, are you taking the opportunity, the God-given opportunity to be encouraging? Do you see the countenance fall on those who walk into the congregation? Do you see the need to stop by and see, is everything okay? You see, we don't want to have that spirit of the world of Haman's family. Oh, that you, that's, you're on your own now. But encouragement is a powerful need in our congregation. In fact, there was a certain elder who made a serious mistake, and he lost his privilege of oversight in the congregation. When the announce, he said this, when the announcement was made about my removal as an elder, I thought the brothers would feel uncomfortable in my company. He says, nevertheless, the elders kept the reason strictly confidential and they went out of their way to give me encouragement. And the rest of the congregation, they likewise extended love and companionship, which definitely promoted my spiritual recovery. Wasn't that nice? Here is a man who spent most of his life encouraging others. And at his spiritual low, his fellow elders and his congregation called him to their side. So here's a man who spent most of his time encouraging others. If he needed encouragement, how much more so to so the rest of us? 
And so that, that's valuable when we think about the power of encouragement. But now Haman, in all his humiliation, he's depressed. He's depressed. And you know when you're depressed, and you know his whole world's upside down, he's thinking, Mordecai? Why Mordecai? I mean, I'm the one who's the prime minister. Esther invited me to a banquet, two banquets. He just can't get his mind around it. And so you know when you're depressed, you want to just curl up and go to bed. But, but he doesn't have a chance. Look at verse 14. It says, while they were yet speaking with him, the court officials themselves arrived and proceeded hastily to bring Haman to the banquet that Esther had made. So while he's thinking about just wallowing in his sorrow, they grab him. Hey, it's time to go to the second banquet. Now, it's interesting I mentioned the second banquet. Because you may wonder, why did Esther not reveal the plight of her people at the first banquet? I mean, this is serious. Why does she wait? Well, obviously, God's Holy Spirit moved her to use discernment. She would use the first banquet to getting good with the king, to gain his favor. Remember, she hadn't seen him in over 30 days. But also, imagine if Esther didn't wait. Would the king have had time to lose sleep? Would he have read the records of how Mordecai saved his life? Would Mordecai have been exalted to this position of greatness? And would Mordecai's life been spared? Obviously, divine deliverance was at work. And friends, who would continue to be at work. Notice chapter 7, verse 1 and 2. It says, Then the king and Haman came into the banquet with Esther the queen. The king now said to Esther also on the second day during the banquet of wine, What is your petition, O Esther the queen? Let it even be given to you. And what is your request? To half of the kingship, let it even be done. So this is the third time he asked that question. Here was Esther's opportunity. The lives of all her people were counting on this one moment. The prayers of the Jews had ascended to Jehovah, asking and directing to give this young girl strength and courage. So would she reveal that she's a Jew? Would she act in faith? Let's look at verse 3 and 4. It says, At this, Esther the queen answered and said, If I have found favor in your eyes, O king, and if to the king it does seem good, let there be given me my own soul at my petition, and my people at my request. For we have been sold. I and my people to be annihilated, killed, and destroyed. Now, if we had been sold for mere men slaves or for mere maidservants, I should have kept silent. But the distress is not appropriate when with damage to the king. Now, now, now Haman's hearing this. He says, we? We who? People? What people? And then it dawns on him, oh, no. The queen is a Jew. And now he's scared. Because he, he knows what it looks like. You see, and, and see, friends, now the king, notice what he says in verse 5 and 6. It says, King Ohasuerus now said, yes. He went on to say to Esther the queen, who is this? And just where is this one who has emboldened himself to do that way? Then Esther said, the man, the adversary, and enemy is this bad Haman. And she's got her finger pointed right in his face. And now he is so scared. In fact, the latter portion of the scripture says, as for Haman, he became terrified because of the king and the queen. You can imagine he's shaking now. He loses his color. I wouldn't be surprised if the man lost his bladder because he knows he's going to die. And the king is so angry, he storms out of the house and he goes into the garden. Perhaps he just has to process this news. You see, friends, it's the way Esther exposed Haman that made it so bad. It appeared that the way she exposed him, it appeared that he knew she was a Jew. It, 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 it made it seem that he was conspiring this treacherous scheme to kill the queen and all of the king's interests. Look at verse 4. Did you notice the latter portion? Esther says, if we had been sold for mere men slaves and for mere maidservants, I should have kept silent. 
In other words, Esther was saying, you know, it, he could have sold the Jews and he could have made a lot of money. But if he's going to execute us all, that's a great financial loss to the king. And see, Haman knows that. And then the latter portion says, the distress is not appropriate when with damage to the king. In other words, he's conspiring to kill the queen's, the king's wife. And so she made it look like he knew these things. And so Haman, he gets up and he's pleading with Esther, my queen, my queen, I didn't know. I didn't know you've got to believe me. I didn't know you were a Jew. I I'm telling the truth, you've got to believe me. And you know, Esther, she's sitting on her couch and she probably doesn't even look at him. She just uh, turns her head and she gives him one of these. That's what you get for messing with my relatives, right? Well, the Bible doesn't say she said anything like that. But she saw divine deliverance at work and saw no need to give him any mercy. But see, Haman, he's persistent. He's so scared. He's so frightened for his life that he falls down on her couch and he starts begging for his life. Now you can imagine this, friends. Esther's laying on the couch. Haman's laying on the couch. The king walks in. And it doesn't look good. Look at verse 8. It says, And the king himself returned from the garden of the palace to the house of the wine banquet. And Haman was fallen upon the couch on which Esther was. Consequently, the king said, is there also to be a raping of the queen with me in the house? The word itself went out of the king's mouth and Haman's face they covered. I mean, you can imagine what the king sees, right? He's walking in here and he's like, you scheme to kill my wife. You, you scheme against me. And now you're all over my woman. And Haman's like, oh man, it's not, it's not what you think. Well, the king had enough. In verse 10, it says, They proceeded to hang Haman on the stake that he had prepared for Mordecai, and the king's rage itself subsided. So isn't that something? You see that 73-foot stake? They put it to use. Except Haman was the one hanging on it. The same stake he wanted for Mordecai, he himself was hanging. How ironic. And then the king took Haman's house and gave it to Esther. He, and it's not like Haman was going to use it, right? And then Esther introduced Mordecai to the king. She told him, this is my older cousin. This is my guardian. He's raised me since I was a child. And the king took the ring that the prime minister would wear, that Haman had on his finger, and he gave it to Mordecai. Now Mordecai is the prime minister of the Persian Empire. Here is a man who was wallowing in the streets, crying in sackcloth and ashes, knowing he's going to die within a year. And now he's second in command to the most powerful nation in the world. Now that's divine deliverance. But you know something, friends? Esther's acts of faith are not over. You see, the decree that Haman was to kill the Jews was still in effect. Furthermore, Haman had 10 sons who were still alive and they would be seeking revenge. Therefore, Esther needed to approach the king again and she wasn't summoned. So would she live or would she die? Turn your Bibles to the 8th chapter. In verse 3, it says, Moreover, Esther spoke again before the king and fell down before his feet and wept and implored favor of him to turn away the badness of Haman the Agagite and his scheme that he had schemed against the Jews. Then the king hold, held the golden scepter out to Esther, at which Esther rose and stood before the king. She now said, If to the king it does seem good, and if I have found favor before him, and the thing is proper before the king, and I am good in his eyes, let it be written to undo the written documents, the scheme of Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, which he wrote to destroy the Jews that are in all the king's jurisdictional districts. For how can I bear it when I must look upon the calamity that will find my people? And how can I bear it when I must look upon the destruction of my relatives? 
Now, the king, he really, you see how she's pleading. She's crying at her heart. And he really wants to help. But he can't. The king cannot undo the written document because Persian law states that a law that's signed with the signet ring can't be undone. So what he decides to do, he says, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give Mordecai, the prime minister, power to write a counter decree. A counter decree against the first one. And so that's what Mordecai does. In fact, notice how he dictates the decree in chapter 8, verse 10 and 11. It says, he proceeded to write in the name of King Ahasuerus and do the sealing with the king's signet ring and send written documents by the hand of the couriers on horses, riding post horses, used in the royal service, sons of speedy mares, that the king granted to the Jews that were in all the different cities to congregate themselves and stand for their soul to annihilate and kill and destroy all the force of the people and jurisdictional district that were showing hostility to them, little ones and women, and to plunder their spoil. Did you notice what the counter decree states? The Jews would no longer have to weep and wail. The Jews would be able to stand for their lives and fight against anyone who brought arms against them. The Jews could stand up and fight any Persian instead of sitting there in sackcloth and ashes. So instead of weeping and wailing, they were rejoicing. In fact, they held a banquet. Look at verse 17. It says, And in all the different jurisdictional districts, and in all the different cities, wherever the word of the king and his law were reaching, there were rejoicing and exultation for the Jews. A banquet! And a good day. And many of the peoples of the land were declaring themselves Jews. For the dread of the Jews had fallen upon them. Isn't that something? Isn't that something? You know, many Persians were now saying, I'm a Jewish proselyte. I'm a Jew now. You know, that teaches us, friends, it's not what we say. Many times our unbelieving relatives, our family, our co-workers, when they see God's spirit being directed in your life, when they see God's hand, that's what may move them to look and peer into the truth. You see, they, those, those Persians could see God's hand moving Esther and Mordecai and those Jews, and that's what moved them. And so months have passed, and it's now the 13th day of Adar. That's around February, March. And that's the day that Haman set formally for the execution of all the Jews. Now, because of the counter decree, the Jews took up arms and they stood and they fought and they killed 500 men in Shushan, the castle alone. And then they killed all of Haman's 10 sons. Then they went out and killed 75,000 more Persians who came up against them. And then for the third time, Esther approached the king without being summoned. He held out that golden scepter and she asked for an extra day of fighting and they killed another 300 Persians. So then Mordecai proceeded to declare Adar 14th and 15th as days of annual rejoicing and celebration and deliverance from Jehovah God. And you know something today? Jews around the world still celebrate those dates. But you really see the faith of Mordecai in deliverance in this account. If you recall back to our first talk, Esther was not, she was not happy about approaching the king by herself, was she? She was initially very afraid. Go back to verse four, uh, chapter 4, verse 14. To help us really see the faith in deliverance that Mordecai had. Esther 4, 14, it says, For you, this is what Mordecai told her when she was afraid. If you are altogether silent at this time, relief and deliverance themselves will stand up for the Jews from another place. You notice that? He said, if you're silent, we're not, my faith is not in you. Deliverance will stand up from another place. Jehovah will take care of us. 
His faith was in Jehovah. And then he says, but who's there knowing that whether it's for a time like this that you have attained to royal dignity? In other words, maybe Jehovah has put you in place as queen to save our lives. He was dead on, wasn't he? You know, friends, this drama really helps us to reflect on our future and our faith. You see, faith is like bricks. You see, each brick can build, help us build a wall of faith. You take a brick like meeting attendance. You take a brick like prayer. Another brick, personal study. Another brick, the field ministry. Another brick, assemblies, conventions, personal study. All of these bricks over time build a wall of faith so that even when Satan wants to break through it, it's impenetrable. But now when you think about all of these personal study, meeting attendance, uh, uh, conventions, they draw you closer to Jehovah. They remind you of the kind of God you're serving, that he will always be there for you. It builds your faith. But what happens if you start building sporadically? You know, I'm out in service, but then I'm a regular a month. So you miss a brick. And you go out in service and you miss a brick. You see, on Tuesday we talked about some of the wonderful things your congregation has been doing. But 16 members of the congregation have missed a brick in the last six months. They're irregular. Now perhaps that number is reflected by some of you who haven't handed in a report. If that's the case, I know you'll hand it in this evening, won't you? Won't you? And so when we are sporadic in building that brick, now a test comes. Are you confident that your wall of faith is going to stand when you have holes in your wall? You see, friends, in what ways has your faith already been tested? Has your faith been tested at work? Has your faith been tested at school? Has your faith been tested with the opposite sex? Has your faith been tested with finances? When your, tastes, your, your faith is tested, you never forget that if you listen to Jehovah and he blessed you, you don't forget those times, even if it was something small. Esther and Mordecai no doubt made it a habit of demonstrating faith even in the little things so that when their lives were tested, salvation to them was in Jehovah. Will our lives ever be tested? Will we need divine deliverance one day? Oh yeah. The Bible says that there will be a great tribulation that will befall you and I, the whole world. And that great tribulation starts with the destruction of false religion by the hands of none other than the governments. How will the governments destroy false religion? Well, the Bible doesn't say specifically. The only thing we can think of is how the governments have tried to destroy our religion. Right now, the governments are working in Russia to ban Jehovah's Witnesses in the entire country. In Armenia, 78 of our brothers stand in jail for not going into the military. Hitler vowed to destroy all of Jehovah's Witnesses in Germany. Well, the Witnesses are flourishing. Hitler's dead, though, isn't he? You see, when the governments try to, to, to go against us, our numbers increase, our ministry increases. And then Satan, the devil, will be sick and tired of your acts of faith, and he will marshal an all-out assault on God's people. And see, at that point, your faith in divine deliverance will be tested. And so when Esther, when you look at her, when her faith was put to the test, she had courageously approached that king three times. But she had no idea that her her guardian who was crying in the middle of the city would be raised to the prime minister. She had no way of seeing that. So she would have never imagined those things happening. So faith allows you to act without seeing. Faith allows you to see with your heart. And so with your heart, you know that Jehovah is your salvation. So all I ask, friends, is that you take advantage of all the provisions that will help build your wall of faith your personal study, your personal uh, ministry, your personal relationship with Jehovah 
Are you building that? You see, you have to resist the world. You have to petition Jehovah for strength so that your wall of faith will stand. And above all, exercise the faith that Esther and Mordecai had who were divinely delivered. Then you can be among those who please Jehovah and attain salvation. The Apostle Paul says, by undeserved kindness, indeed you have been saved through faith. He said, this is not owing to you. He says, it's God's gift. So brothers and sisters... May you and I exercise the faith necessary so that we can be divinely delivered by the hands of none other than our great sovereign Lord, Jehovah God.